Hello there and welcome. Welcome to Watch Mojo. So recently I've been getting a lot of people saying, Dankula, where are your free speech videos? It's been a very, very long time since you uploaded a video on freedom of speech. Well, that's not true. I do it, like, all the time on my second channel. I just haven't done it on this channel. But for articles and news stories relating to freedom of speech, I do all of that on my second channel. It's pretty much almost all I talk about on my second channel. I haven't uploaded to the second channel in a few weeks, though. Because the world's currently on fucking fire. But before we get into the video, this video actually has a sponsor. A company that is very anti-censorship and very pro-free speech. And that is Nord, with their new product, NordPass. If you are smart, then you are using a different password for literally every single account you have online. And if you are like me, you are constantly forgetting these passwords. But with NordPass Password Manager, it stores all of your passwords and it encrypts them. So you never need to worry about forgetting them. It also comes with autosave and autofill, so you can log into your accounts in just a few clicks. A password generator to help you create strong passwords. It stores your credit card details and all of the stored information is encrypted with XChaCha20 encryption for the vault and Argon2 for key derivation. The data is also encrypted on your device before it gets backed up on Nod servers, making it so secure that even Nod can't see it. It comes with optional two-factor authentication, desktop apps and browser extensions, 24-7 customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you want NordPass, then click my link down below, nordpass.com slash countdankula to get 50% off and get NordPass for only $2.49 a month, plus an extra month free. Absolute bargain. Click the link. However, I do feel that it is long overdue for a free speech upload on the main channel purely because I have come across a certain problem. A problem that I'm getting a little bit sick of dealing with. Now you see, whenever you are a free speech activist, you spend an awful lot of time arguing with the anti-free speech mob. You know, the authoritarians. And in my dealings with them, they present, you know, to me, a lot of arguments against freedom of speech even though a lot of these things uh, aren't really arguments, but let's, let's be generous and call them arguments. Now, these arguments are very, very common. They get used an awful lot by the anti-free speech mob. The problem is these arguments have been absolutely blown out of the water, absolutely destroyed, absolutely refuted over and over and over again. And despite that, <laughs> these people keep making these arguments. I've basically had the exact same conversation over and over again, just with different people, of me explaining why their argument is fucking stupid. So I'm just I'm just gonna set I'm just gonna set the record straight now about these stupid things that the anti free speech mob say. This this isn't really for you guys, right? That this is more for me. So see, instead of having to have a great big long winded fucking argument on Twitter, the same argument I've had a hundred times in the past, I'm instead just going to link them a timestamp to this video, <laughs> right? So I hope you guys enjoy the video and I hope you have fun. I hope you, I hope you, I hope you have a great time, right? Like and subscribe, fucking lick my balls, all that good shit, right? But this isn't for you. This is for me, <laughs> right? This this video is to stop me wasting so much time and to help me uh, preserve my sanity. So what I have done is I have comprised a list of uh, 10 stupid arguments or hypocrisies or fallacies or what have you that people keep making against freedom of speech. And the type of people that keep saying these things are either complete newcomers to the free speech debate or they just simply haven't bothered taking any time to actually understand what freedom of speech is. So these are these are sort of like a list of don'ts in the world of uh, free speech advocacy. They are considered uh, social faux pas, you know, like playing Stairway to Heaven in a guitar shop or getting a 15-year-old pregnant. Number one, support is not agreement. I personally feel that if someone wants to make racist comments, although unpleasant, they have a right to do so. 
Wow, okay, so you hate black people then? This is the most common one that they use. They try to say that just because you support a person's right to say things, that means that you also agree with the things that person is saying. Which, as we all know, is absolute garbage. That is an absolute garbage statement. And yet, despite that, this is the most common one that they use, and they still keep using it. Racists right now are the biggest target of the authoritarian, so when you are a free speech advocate, you spend an awful lot of time defending racists, because, like it or not, rights are universal, and everybody gets them. Even racists. And because you spend so much of your time defending racists, people will use this argument to brand you, yourself, as a racist. Or the free speech group that you are a part of. And there's a very good reason why they do this. It's because they don't like free speech. They don't like it. They don't want it. But they know that if they come out and argue against it, then they're arguing against freedom of speech. They're arguing against literal freedom, which is uh, bad optics, you know. It's not, it's not a very good look. So what they will opt to do instead is a really underhanded and shady technique is they will instead poison the well of information about free speech advocates or free speech groups so that people think that they are racists, which means a lot of people won't want to associate with them, won't want to support them, and that damages the free speech movement overall. This argument, you know, sometimes it's just used by an idiot who doesn't understand what free speech advocacy is, but a lot of the times it's used by someone who knows fine well what they're doing. They know that it's a bullshit argument, but they also know that it's very, very effective at poisoning the well and therefore persuading the uninitiated people against joining or supporting free speech advocacy, which is why they do it. And the argument has been used so often and so effectively that there are a lot of people out there who, when they hear the words free speech advocate, their mind immediately thinks, racist. There are some people among the authoritarians who, for some reason, praise Noam Chomsky, and I think it's because they don't know that Noam Chomsky is hardcore freedom of speech. He's pretty fucking hardcore on freedom of speech. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to play a clip now of uh, Noam Chomsky explaining his stance on freedom of speech and people with horrible views. Okay, so I'm I'm hoping maybe maybe these words coming from uh, Noam Chomsky's mouth will will help you guys pay attention. I do not think that the state ought to have the right to determine historical truth and to punish people who deviate from it. I'm not willing to give the state that right, even if they happen to. But are you denying truth? that the gas chambers ever First existed? Not. But I'm saying, if you believe in freedom of speech, you believe in freedom of speech for views you don't like. I mean, Goebbels was in favor of freedom of speech for views he liked, right? So was Stalin. If you're in favor of freedom of speech, that means you're in favor of freedom of speech precisely for views you despise. Otherwise, you're not in favor of freedom of speech. Number two. Criticism is not anti-free speech. I get really happy when conservatives die. <sighs> Spicy, but uh, that's a pretty shitty thing to say. Well, that's my free speech. Why are you being anti-free speech? I thought you liked free speech, you fucking hypocrite. This is another common one, but it's actually quite a funny one because it is a pro-free speech argument. Or at least they believe it's a pro-free speech argument. But it's an argument that's usually always made by people who hate free speech. If you say something and then I decide to disagree with it, or challenge it, or debate it, or mock it, or ridicule it, etc, etc. That is not me stifling your freedom of speech. Okay, I have done absolutely nothing to prevent you from saying what you just said, nor have I put any measures in place to prevent you from saying what you just said in future. I just simply have a few things that I would like to say about what you just said. And then, once I'm finished saying what I want to say about what you just said, you can say what you just said again, if you like. Because I haven't restricted your speech in any way. Responding to speech is an integral part of freedom of speech. 
Everybody gets freedom of speech. Freedom of speech doesn't mean that you get to say things and then people aren't allowed to say anything about what you just said, right? People are always going to have something that they want to say about what you just said because people have free speech and they have the right to comment on things. For example, this video. People are probably going to disagree with some of the things that I say here. And then if you want to voice your disagreements, you have the free speech to do so, and you can do it in the comment box down below. And just please be satisfied with the fact that <laughs> I don't fucking read those. People can use their free speech to comment on anything they want. This can be things like video games and movies, to literature and the fine arts. The local museum is having a new exhibit. They can be talking about new hairstyles, fashion, current trends, culture. They could be talking about the fact that Jonathan's fucking around with the baker's wife. They can talk about absolutely anything because that is what free speech is all about. Okay, they can talk about everything from the current political climate all the way down to your really fucking stupid take. The point I'm trying to make is, is the fact that people can reply to your speech with their own speech is a very good thing. It is a very great sign because when conversations happen, people learn from it. <laughs> Not all people learn from it, but hopefully a lot of people do. And I like that. I like that. Even when I see two people that I disagree with so fucking much... Having a discussion with each other, I think that is fantastic. I think that is fucking great because people are learning, people are developing, people are either getting their own ideas or coming up with their own opinions. Everyone is being lifted intellectually and I think that is fucking fantastic. But even despite that, some people out there still make this argument, especially if you're a free speech advocate because they think it's some type of gotcha. Like, oh, you're criticising me. I thought you liked freedom of speech. It's, that's not in any way a gotcha. It's actually an extremely fucking stupid thing to say. When I criticise something that you have said, I haven't in any way restricted your ability to say that thing. You can say it again if you want. You can grab a megaphone and shout it out your window if you want. You can type it in a tweet. You can put it in your blog. You can go out and do all of those things. My criticism has not prevented you from doing so. The only thing that my criticism may have done is brought into question the validity of what you just said. And we both know that's what you're really mad about. I keep getting people criticising me. They keep challenging everything that I'm saying. And I've got no way to argue back against them. Maybe I need to form stronger arguments. I'll just... Maybe I just need to face the fact that my ideas are just wrong and I should take a step back and reevaluate the way that I think and try and think more objectively and logically. Maybe, maybe I should change my mind. Or, okay, hear me out. Or we ban people from saying that we're wrong. Number three. You just want freedom from consequences. This is another one that they commonly use. Whenever you argue in favour of freedom of speech, they'll usually say something to you like, oh, you just want freedom from consequences, which is a gross misinterpretation of what we actually want. And this misinterpretation is usually done willfully and on purpose with bad faith intent. It's a really stupid argument because speech always has consequences. For every action, there is a reaction. What free speech advocates actually have a problem with is the source of these consequences and the extent of these consequences. For example, the most common type of consequence to freedom of speech. Social consequences. The way that society around you reacts to the things that you said. For example, if you go around telling everyone, oh, your hair looks great today, you look like you've lost weight, or you, you're looking lovely today, then those people will be nice and friendly towards you and perceive you to be a nice person. I'm just kidding, you'll be dragged to HR and fired for being a rapist. Right, jokes aside, if you go around acting nice to people, then people will most likely be nice back to you, tell other people that you're a nice person and perceive you as a nice person. 
The things that you said influenced their social behaviour towards you. These are social consequences. The same goes for if you walk around saying to people, Hey Stacey, looking pretty fucking fat today. Then people are still going to adjust their social behaviour towards you. Most likely uh, by calling you an arsehole, perceiving you to be an arsehole and not wanting to associate with you. Again, social consequences. And social consequences like that are absolutely fine. We all experience them probably hundreds of times a day. That's the one thing that everybody has in common. We all experience social consequences and they influence a lot of our lives. I mean, you right now watching this at home, your little social group, your little group of friends, all of that is influenced by social consequences. And this can be driven on from things like a basic friendly conversation right up to telling a joke that made the entire room really, really mad. And I am very well versed in the latter. But you do get types of social consequences that cannot be justified. You know, things that are usually a very extreme response to a very minor thing. For example, like telling an offensive joke. Now, what really happens when you get offended? Nothing really. I mean, you're probably going to be a little bit upset for about five minutes and then after that you'll be fine. Was it really that bad? No, it wasn't really. Stop being a fucking baby. Grow up. Move on. However, some people have taken it upon themselves to dish out extremely draconian punishments for these very, very minor offences, like offending people. You know, things like deplatforming, getting them fired from their jobs, making sure they can never earn a living again, you know, th things like that. You know, that's which is kind of the equivalent of uh, giving a first-time shoplifter a 10 year sentence, right? You know, the punishment doesn't exactly fit the crime. You have hurt my feelings, citizen. And even though I'll probably be fine in about 10 minutes, I feel an appropriate response to this is to make sure that you can never get a job again for the rest of your life. Now the problem is, doing those things is part of freedom of speech. These people do have a right to do that. The same as people have a right to make racist comments. They have the right to do it doesn't mean that it's not shitty. But the thing is, the people that, you know, are doxers, harassers, you know, they go after employers and stuff like that, they all occupy this this little bubble. They're their own little social group. And the reason that they're in a bubble is because nobody else wants to associate with them. Because everyone outside the bubble is looking in on the bubble, knowing that the people in here are absolute pieces of shit. They perceive them to be arseholes, they know that they are arseholes, and they tell everybody else that they are arseholes. Which is why this little bubble of those people, you know, it hasn't, hasn't exactly grown much over the years, has it? You know, these guys have kind of sealed themselves away in their own little bubble because nobody else in society wants to associate with them. Social consequences. These extreme social consequence punishments for extremely minor offences, although these people have the right to do it, it should always be called out and always pointed out. Because the one thing that I've noticed is, through doing that and through the magic of social consequences, that bubble has gotten an awful lot smaller over the years. Because these people are kind of realising, oh shit, I have completely destroyed my life. And now, now it's only me left. Now it's only me left. And everybody thinks I am a piece of shit. Because you are. But then we get to the other type of consequences. Criminal consequences. Which I feel cannot be justified because, as we all know, the government gets very, very many things wrong. For example, in my case, blatant joke, blatantly taking the piss, blatantly not a fucking Nazi... It's my dog lifting its paw. He's hardly marching towards Poland because I keep the door locked. That was clearly a joke and I was still found guilty for causing people gross offence when what constitutes as gross offensiveness is a completely subjective metric. You know, Section 127's bullshit, put it in the bin. It's draconian as fuck. It's an authoritarian's wet dream. But then you get other examples as well, like, for example, the Chelsea Russell case. She posted lyrics on her Instagram page in tribute 
to a boy in her estate that had been knocked down and killed in a car accident. And because these lyrics contained the N-word, because they were from a rap song, she was arrested, charged, and found guilty. And eventually, you know, after a lot of fucking uproar, she got her sentence overturned. So things like that, criminal consequences, absolute fucking garbage, because, you know, it's that old argument, who gets to define hate? Who gets to define gross offensiveness? Who gets to define these terms? Should it be the government? (laughs) <laughs> I think I, I think we, we have an entire uh, wealth from history as to why it is a very bad idea to let the governments decide what you can and cannot say. However, in the you know metric of social consequences, each individual getting to decide for themselves how they respond to it, I'm fine with that. I'm all about that free will. I love that free will. Social consequences, I'm absolutely fine with. You know... Just as long as the social consequences don't involve violating your rights. You know, for example, if I walk up to a man and say, Good morning, and he punches me in the face. You know, (laughs) social consequence, but he he doesn't have a right to do that. I'm also going to assume that he knew who I was and he reads The Guardian. In conclusion, social consequences, fine. Criminal consequences, go fuck yourself. Number four. The butt. Look, I'm in favour of free speech, but, that's cool, I'm not racist, but, despite... Number five, Mr. Fascist, please save me from the fascists. I hate Donald Trump, I hate the Tories, they are bigots, they are racists, and they are fascists. And I also want them to pass more laws to control my speech. I have never understood this one. I've truly, I've truly never understood this one. I mean, the current leaders that are in power, Trump and Boris from the Tories, you know, people that the anti-free speech mob absolutely hate, you know, people that the anti-free speech mob actually believe are genuine fascists, yet they want them to pass more laws to control speech. I mean, if I personally thought that the leader of my country was an actual fascist, the last thing that I would do is give him control of my speech. Right? I don't really need to explain any further why this one is so fucking stupid. Right? Okay? Moving on. Number six. Oh, irony. I want the government to have absolute control over everyone's speech, so that we can prevent a fascist government from ever happening. It is quite funny to suggest that the government adopt a fascist policy to fight against fascism, but that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on everyone's perception of the government, especially the anti-free speech crew. They see the government as its defender against fascism taking place. But this is the thing is, right, you know, it's a defender, it's a force for good. That's the way they see the government. But it's a lot like a Jedi. You know, a Jedi is a protector and a force for good. But a Jedi can be corrupted by the dark side. Okay, so even though these people right now see the government as a protector and a force for good, you know, against fascism, the primary thing that can be corrupted by fascism is the government. Picture the government as a tank. And you want the tank to be nice and big and strong to protect you against fascism. So you might slap some more armour on there, you add more guns to it, you make it faster, you make it more powerful, and eventually make it into an absolutely unstoppable machine. Which is all fine and good. Until a fascist gets in the tank. And this tank is now perfectly equipped for his needs. It has all of the tools and laws and legislations that he needs to enact fascism. And the reason he has that is because you built the fucking tank. I'm just saying that if you really are worried about fascism, then maybe don't build the exact tool that a fascist needs to enact fascism. Okay? Making the government more powerful to prevent fascism is like covering trees in gasoline to prevent forest fires. Number seven. The Victim 180. I can't believe my account got banned. Where, where are all the free speech 
warriors out there who are going to defend me over my band account. Help. Where are all the freeze peach boys? I need help from the freeze peach. I'll help you out, but I can see here in your past that you conducted flagging campaigns of right-wing content and cheered when they get banned. You were tweeting at YouTube asking them to ban Steven Crowder. You were tweeting at venues asking them to de-platform people. I mean, I'll still help, but I just feel you're being a little bit hypocritical now that you yourself have become the victim of the very behaviour that you were taking part in. <laughs> can someone report this guy, please? I have seen... Far too many times, people who are outright authoritarians getting some kind of social media account banned and then all of a sudden, free speech matters again. Or they get banned, they pretend to have a change of heart and ask for help from the, the free speech guys. And then when we help them out and they get their accounts back, they then just go straight back into being an authoritarian because they're fucking idiots who did not learn their lesson. These are the types of people who only care about freedom of speech when they themselves become the victim. And if you are one of those people, and you come to us, the Free Speech guys, for help, we will still help you. Because as free speech advocates, we understand that absolutely everyone has a right to freedom of speech. If you want to be a free speech advocate, you need to be fair. You must be fair. So if we are able, or if I am able, I will still help you out. But oh god, I'm going to be smug as fuck while I do it. Number eight. You have the right to remain offended. I, all too often, keep hearing people saying this extremely stupid phrase. You cited freedom of speech in that. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended. There is no such thing as a right to not be offended. There is no such thing. Human rights, lawful rights, natural rights, God-given rights, shit, property rights, pick any fucking list and you won't find that right on them because it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a right to not be offended. Shut the fuck up. Number nine. The empty room fallacy. This is a newer one that has been cropping up a lot more lately and it relates more to deplatforming. Now, authoritarians are making the argument that even if you are not allowed on any of the platforms and you are not allowed to, in public, say the things that you want to say, the fact that you can still say these things in an empty room means that you have free speech. This is a fallacy, because authoritarians are not acknowledging the actual purpose of speech, which is to communicate information. You need to be able to communicate information with other people. That is the purpose of freedom of speech. The point of speech is to be able to communicate information to another person or persons. That is its purpose. That is its point, okay? It's like having a gun with no bullets or a car with no engine. Yeah, you still have the thing, but your ability to use it for its actual intended purpose has been completely taken away. And authoritarians think that they can argue against that by saying, well, you still have a car, you still have a gun. If speech cannot be heard by others, then it is not imparting any information and is therefore not fulfilling its intended purpose. So if someone takes away or restricts your ability to do that, then that is an infringement on your freedom of speech. It's kind of like a government completely banning gay couples from kissing or holding hands in public or discussing homosexuality in any way while they're in public. And the only time that they are allowed to do that is in the privacy of their own bedroom. And that is the only place they are allowed to do it. And then the government turning around and going, what, you're still allowed to be gay. It's not exactly like that, it's only sort of like that, but you get what I'm trying to say. People need to have the ability to communicate with others for their speech to actually serve a purpose, and I think that that is what the next step for the authoritarians is going to be. If they can't fully take away the speech, then they'll try to take away its purpose. Number 10. 
private companies can do what they want. Now this one is actually true. It's just very often used with so fucking much hypocrisy. For example, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube constantly bans, deboosts or restricts right-wing content and all of that has been proven thanks to the work done by Project Veritas. The authoritarians who usually want to destroy big business will, when it benefits them, argue in favour of big business by saying private companies can do what they want. I always laugh whenever I see someone on Twitter making that argument and then I check their bio and it says communist or socialist. (laughs) It's like, private companies can do what they want, but not with their means of production. However, the argument, private companies can do what they want, is true. However, we all know that if the bias was the other way around, then these guys would be making the exact same arguments that we are. The only reason that they're supporting this stuff just now is because it makes it a lot easier for them to win because they aren't the victims. For now... You do not have a right to a platform because private companies get to choose who they do not do business with. But private companies also get to choose who they do do business with because it is their right to do so. Which means that if a company has chosen to platform you, for example a venue has agreed to host your event, that is a private company doing what it wants to do. It is their right to do so. And then these exact same people will throw that argument right out of the window and start harassing the venue trying to get the event shut down, even though this is a private company doing what it wants. The authoritarians will do things like harassing the venue, harassing the promoters, harassing the managers, harassing the staff, harassing the customers. They'll probably review bomb the venue online. All manners of things, even though it's a private company just trying to do what it wants. I mean, when we were doing our tour of America, it got so extreme, you know, the violence got that bad that one of the venues cancelled because they received phone calls from Antifa who were threatening to firebomb it. So authoritarians will make the argument a private company can do what it wants right up until a private company does something that they don't want it to do. So authoritarians, I'm afraid, are going to need to pick one. Can a private company really do what it wants or can a private company only do what you want? That is the end of the list, but there are a few things about freedom of speech that I do want to highlight that do actually warrant more discussion. Okay, this is things like death threats and incitement to violence. These are things that I do feel should be looked at by the police. Not instant arrests, not instant arrests, just investigated and reasonable measures put in place to establish whether or not any imminent criminal activity is due to take place. Okay, and that is why I would like them to apply something called the Brandenburg Test. This test was established in 1969 in Brandenburg versus Ohio, where a KKK leader named Clarence Brandenburg was arrested for some inflammatory things that he said. Brandenburg did get convicted but his lawyers managed to successfully overturn the sentence because they managed to argue that the court could not prove that Brandenburg's words would imminently be acted upon and there were events that followed afterwards that proved that Brandenburg's words were not acted upon. The Brandenburg test examines very, very many things, things like the words used, the context they were used in, where they were used. It also examines the person, that person's history, that person's social standing, any authoritative powers that person might have. Very, very many things are taken into consideration in the Brandenburg test. And the point of the test is to examine absolutely everything about the situation and make a reasonable judgment as to whether or not any what is described as imminent lawless action would take place. Now what I'll do is I'll give you a a very, very dumbed down example of the Brandenburg test. Let's take the phrase, I'm going to kill you. Sounds very ominous on its own. But what we can do is we can have a look at the context of it, who said it, how it was said, so on and so on, and apply the Brandenburg test to it, and then we can make a reasonable judgement as to whether or not any imminent lawless action will take place because of these words. 
So we've examined the entire situation around that phrase and in our investigation we have discovered that the phrase I'm going to kill you was sent via an Xbox Live message by a 12 year old to another 12 year old because he was really pissed off that he beat him in a game of Call of Duty. Now, is there going to be any imminent lawless action? Basically, do we believe that this 12 year old is actually going to carry out his threat and murder another 12 year old over a game of Call of Duty? No, we don't. Chances of that happening, extremely unlikely. It passes the Brandenburg test, no further police action required. However, let's take the same phrase again. I'm going to kill you. Except this time, it was sent via a private Facebook message to a girl by her ex-boyfriend who has just been released from prison on bail for assaulting her and he has a long history of violence against her. Uh oh. Big fucking red flag. Chance of any imminent lawless action? I would probably say pretty high. So uh, yes, the cops should probably get in on that. Those were obviously two examples at opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, all the situations in which the Brandenburg test needs to be applied aren't going to be as almost, you know, black and white as that. It's going to require a lot of nuanced thinking and understanding of culture and the way people interact online, which I feel is another problem. The police and the courts don't understand internet culture and the way that people in our circles interact with each other online, and I think that that is probably the reason for the extremely high arrest rate we have right now for the way people conduct themselves online. But I feel that if we applied the Brandenburg test in a lot of these cases, then the police could focus primarily on the ones that could actually cause imminent lawless action instead of wasting their time on complete bullshit. There is another area of free speech that I feel needs to be highlighted and I feel it's become a lot more relevant in the modern day. A lot of people think that free speech just means you have a right to say things, but it goes further than that. You also have a right not to be forced to say things. If you're forced to say something against your will, that is called compelled speech. And that is a violation of your free speech rights. There might be something that you don't agree with. Something that you actually hate. But if someone asks you for your opinion on these things, you know that if you say how you actually feel, you'll face serious repercussions for it. So, in order to avoid those serious repercussions, you say something that you don't actually believe. Your speech was compelled, either through threat of violence or, you know, criminal prosecution or, you know, any of those other things. Either way, your free speech rights were violated. To give you a pretty extreme example of this, Soviet Russia. Let's say someone came up to you and said, do you love Comrade Stalin? Now, you don't love Comrade Stalin. In fact, you kind of hate Comrade Stalin. But you know what will happen to you if you say that. So, in order to avoid any, you know, any unscheduled trips to the Gulag, you say, yes, I love Comrade Stalin. Your speech was compelled. You were forced to say something that you don't believe. And compelled speech is something that is used very often in the modern day. Pronouns. If you use the wrong pronoun, you can end up in a lot of trouble. You can lose your job, be deplatformed, all of these other things. Thankfully right now, it's mostly social consequences for that. Mostly. And in the spectrum of this argument, you have two extremes. On one side, you have people demanding that you use their pronouns, and if you don't, you will face criminal prosecution compelled speech. And then on the other side, you've got people that want to outright ban all the usage of these silly stupid pronouns. Restricting speech. And my solution sits right here. Right here in the middle. Where people can use whatever pronouns they want 
because that is their right to free speech and their right to freedom of expression. You can have whatever pronoun you want. You can address each other whatever way you want. I will not restrict your speech and I will defend your right to have your silly little pronouns. But then also, people cannot be forced against their will to use your pronouns because these people also have free speech and have a right to not have their speech compelled. Which is why I like it here in the middle, because right here in the middle, nobody is having their rights violated. Everybody here has freedom of speech. Everybody here has rights. Oh, he's in the middle. He's in the middle of fucking fence sitter. You fucking filthy centrist fence sitter. Fence sitter. Fence sitter suggests that I am undecided. I am not undecided. I have fully come to a decision. And my decision is that you are both fucking stupid. So thank you for joining me in this catch-up on freedom of speech. Hopefully these arguments have finally been put to bed and I won't have idiots on fucking Twitter making them at me anymore. If you continue to do so, I am just going to link to you a timestamp in this video while calling you a fucking idiot. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Also, I've teamed up with Shirtless Cash and there is new merch. You can find the link for that down below. You can wear it while you're out at the disco. But count thank you on YouTube. Everybody should subscribe. <laughs> yeah.